Hello, hello. Welcome again to the Yagcast. This time we are talking about Amores 315. This is the last poem of the Amores. Uh, we've jumped all the way ahead. We've skipped book two. We've skipped all the other uh, previous 14 poems in book three. We're going to go to the end just to give us kind of a, a, a bookend. And, uh, and this isn't just a random poem. It isn't just the end. Um, it is a, uh, a great kind of encapsulation or a great sort of uh, climax to some of the things, some of the themes that we've been talking about. And you'll notice if you go all the way back to 1.1, 1 .1, uh, Ovid has very deliberately bookended his poems because a lot of the themes are the same here. Remember in 1.1, 1 .1, he he said, oh, you know, I, I, I want to write epic, but I, I can't. I, what is this? What is this feeling inside of me? Why does my bed not? You know, why, why, why can't I, why am I restless in my sleep and my sheets are just aren't fitting right? What's, what's going on? What's wrong with me? And then he gave in to love, right? He, he said, okay, I'm in, I'm in. And, uh, you know, let's talk about Corinna. And we went through that and we tried to pass some love notes and all of this kind of thing. So now we have, again, we fast forwarded quite a bit to this 315, but here in 315, he reprises the whole love and war thing into a really uh, extenuating um, degree. He reprises the idea that he is a member of the equestrian class. This is something that was really important to him. It was really out in the forefront. Um, and you can argue that he, he – it, not that he feels insecure about his status, but that he needs to he, – he does need to make his status known because he is – walking around in a world of patricians and in class you know class was everything in the roman world so I, I you know that's that's part of it but there's the there's the imagery and the metaphor of being a cavalry member being an equace uh in the army and and all of that and so it all kind of comes back and fits and and just as in 1.1 1 .1, when he said look i'm i'm a writer of 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 epic Right, I, I read the Metamorphoses. Let me write about conflict and warfare, and let me write about heavy material and heavy meter. And then he gives in. Well, here he says, "Okay, I've given in, and I'm done. And so, bring on the epic." <laughs> so it is very chiastic, right? It's very uh, kind of full circle here. So I, I do want to point out a couple things just as we go through three fifteen. Um, one is we have a bunch of proper nouns, okay, uh, all the way in here. And so there's all of these evocation. Now, of course, polygni and polygni are referencing the same thing here. Of course, we have Roma, but down here, here, Solmo. Okay, so just a couple things. One, uh, polygnian, um, there is a town polygni, and this is where Ovid is for, or excuse, yeah, Ovid, sorry. This is where Ovid is from. He says, I'm an alumnus. I'm a, a child, a native of the Polygnian Rus, of the Polygnian countryside. And he brings it up again down here. He says, let me, let me be called, or really probably I will be called the future indicative, the glory, the honor of the Polygnian race, the Polygnian people. So he, he mentions this twice, uh, but the second mention is uh, right here with two poets that I think we know, um, Virgil, who will read in AP, and then Catullus, who we're actually going to read in like a week. Um, and so he brings up Virgil, uh, Virgilius, and Mantua, from which he came. So uh, a town in Cisalpine, Gaul. So this is the part of France that's right cisalpine. So it's right near the Alps. It's right in the northern territory there of, of Italy. Uh, and then Verona. So also from cisalpine Gaul. And this is where Catullus is from. So he's comparing himself here to an epic poet and here to a, a, a poet of love elegy, right? The Catullus, his famous uh uh, Carmina, right? Uh, da mi basi amile, and all of these wonderful little quips uh, that we're going to read here in a little bit. And so here in the midst, I mean, we're sort of in the middle of the poem here. It's only 20 lines long. He, he, he sandwiches himself basically between this epic poet, poet, poet and this, this love poet, right? And so there's this progression. He says, uh, you know, uh, at some point he says, well, it's further down, but he talks about the mother of love, mother of tender love, the mother of tender lovers. So we're talking about Venus. Um, and he says, my elegy 
uh, my elegies have passed the final meta. So if we think about a chariot race course, a circus. So here is the oval of the circus. Okay. Here is, let me see if I can, uh, I don't know if it's going to let me draw here. Hang on. Let's try this again. All right. So here is my circus. <laughs> Darn it. Okay. Anyway, in that oval, you have the spina, the, the spine. So you got to race around this. And then at each end, you have these turning, these, these big posts so that the the charioteers can't cheat and try to sort of cut across the end of these big turning posts so he's talking about i'm in my chariot and i'm rounding that turning post okay so the final turning post is passed by uh by these elegies is sort of grazed across the by these elegies or by my elegies um and again, we, we have these, the, the, the tension between love and war, um, when he talks about his home and he talks about, uh, his ancestors and he talks about the fact that he is an equus, he's an equestrian. And he says, look, I'm, I'm not an equestrian that was just made an equestrian. I'm not a new equestrian just made by all the warfare that we've recently happened upon. And that warfare that we've recently happened upon that we've recent happen recently happened upon um is the the allied bands of men or the allied hands so like uh we're talking about those social wars that happened in the middle of the first century bc so you know around 80 bc or so uh that his town took polygni or took a big part in and he says look i, I wasn't made in a question from the money from that my my family's old you know i'm from the old school equestrians so uh, okay uh so here we go right so here's solmo again another reference to uh to ovid's home i think we get the footnote here the town a town in polygny his birthplace and so there again there's this sort of justification of his lineage and an honoring of his lineage and this sort of here is my lineage you don't don't ignore it right as maybe opposed to the the patrician uh lineage here um he uh he imagines a traveler coming to his town and and looking at the walls which are placed emphatically here now there's a, a horrible enjambment because or I guess it's probably the best enjambment because you really do have to delay looking at it because we got to flip the page. But basically, look, some guest looking at the Moynia down here in line 12 of Watery Solmo, you know, he's going to look at that and go, yeah, that's a big city. And and it's uh, it's it's a big deal, you know, and a boy, if if that town is such a big deal, boy, what what a poet it must be. It must bear. And so, you know, whatever whatever sort of little thing that you are, well, I call you great. So a little bit of a humble, well, a lot of a humble brag, <laughs> I think from Ovid here. And so back to our military imagery, he says, okay, Colte Puer, and okay, parens of the Colte Puer. So we're talking about Cupid, we're talking about Venus here, the Amethusian parent. So Amethusa being a, a town or a Mothus, I think is the name of the town here. Let's take a look at Lafleur's. Um, yeah, Amathus is a town in Cyprus where Venus is, is known to dwell. So, okay, Cupid, okay, Venus, you gotta wellate your signa. You gotta pull up your military standards get him out of my field. You're done. And, uh, uh, you know, we got, we got Lias here. We got Bacchus. He's waving his thyrsus at me and in crepuit means to make a sound. So he's making a sound with that, that rattle, that thyrsus rattle. And so, you know, um, he, he's calling my name. Bacchus is calling my name. So go find some other place to stomp your horses of war and so genial muse goodbye imbeles elegy goodbye unwarlike elegies see you later walete survivor after my fate 
opus monsurum, a work that will remain surviving alive after my fate. So he ends his amores with this ultimate hope of, of poets, right? That their work will survive them, that their work will make them immortal. Horace uh, says basically the same thing. He says, I'm, I'm, I, I intend to make a war more, or I tend to make uh, poems, poetry more durable than bronze, right? Something that will last forever. And that's a very epic kind of thing to say, right? That's a very, um, not, not fanciful uh, in the sense of like elegy and elegiac and love and all of this kind of thing. So just as we started struggling against the muse of epic, and then accepting the muse of epic. Well, now, um, or, or excuse me, just as we struggled against the, the the muse of elegy, and then accepted elegy, and then wrote elegy, basically he's saying here, okay, I'm done, right? I, I've written my elegies. It's time to leave them behind. It's time to go back to epic. Goodbye, elegies. Bring on the warfare. <laughs> but let's not forget, Love is war, right? Love is a battlefield. Pat Benatar, 2,000 years later. That's it. Okay, everybody, I hope that helped give you some context, and I want you to have a great day. Take care.